Uh, thanks, uh, and uh, kia ora tato. Uh, goodbye, Westminster. Hello, Wellington. Uh, I'm reminded of Mark Twain's uh, statement that reports of his death had been greatly exaggerated, and I think the same is the case, really, uh, of uh, Westminster. Uh, in Treo, the language of the First Peoples of Aotearoa, New Zealand. A karakia, uh, not a, a, a secular karakia, not a, not a prayer but an affirmation. And for those of you who want to join in, uh, please feel free. Whakataka te hau ki te uru. Whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā ki na kena ki ota. Kia mātarata ki tai. E hi ake ana te atakura. He tio, he huka, he hau, u. Ti hei mōri ora. Uh, and it's poetry, really. I think it's beautiful. Cease the winds from the west, cease the winds from the south. Let the breeze blow over the land, let the breeze blow over the ocean. Let the red-tipped dawn come with a sharpened ear, a touch of frost, a promise of a glorious day. Uh, and Catherine talked about constitutions and, of course, the United Kingdom, such as it is united. Uh, Not for long. New Zealand and Israel form a club of three and having... Uh, constitutions which are codified in as much as they're written down, but not codified in statute. I think it would be fair to say. Uh, and Catherine referred to, uh, to Northcote and Trevelyan, and I was reflecting on the fact that Northcote and Trevelyan, who were both officers of Her Majesty's Treasury, I think, uh, completed their report in 1854. Uh, 14 years earlier, in 1840, the British Crown negotiated the Treaty of Waitangi with the Tangata Whenua, the first peoples of Aotearoa. Uh, New Zealand. An image. What does it say to you? I'm not sure why I decided to include it with the images, but when I saw it, I just found it so compelling. And I, what did it say to me? It evoked Stanley Milgram's obedience to authority. Obedience to authority. Uh, it evoked uh, managing, managing and thriving in turbulent times. It evoked the look of powerlessness on the part of a young man uh, in the armed forces that invoked the sense of power and of violence of others faced with events that happened only on the 15th of July. Again, I'm not sure what bearing it has on what we're talking about today, but I did sense in some way it was there. The essence of Westminster. Some of you will be familiar with this. Um, and I'm going to use the standard definition, which has been provided by Rod Rhodes and, and, and Patrick Weller. It'll be known to a number of you who have contributed with others in this room, uh, not least John Wanner, in, in writing on this. Um, uh, but I would make a point before I go through the five elements very briefly, and it's something that's not covered in the definition, but it is about something that Bill English said. And I must say, I have immense respect for Bill English as a minister and, and as a deputy prime minister, but I do disagree with him on, on one or two points. I disagree with him that everything can be distilled down to a relationship between government departments and consumers. Uh, I think one can consume from McDonald's without having any sense of ownership of the organisation. But if one is a consumer, of the services provided by the Department of Social Services, one consumes as a consumer and as a citizen. And I think that constitutional dimension is actually quite important. So, the standard definition of Westminster, the concentration of political power in a collective and responsible cabinet, the accountability of ministers to parliament, heightened here because I think it is one of the key issues for us, a constitutional bureaucracy with a non-partisan and expert civil service and opposition acting as a recognised executive and waiting as part of the regime and parliamentary sovereignty. There's actually two collapsed into five, I think. There's parliamentary sovereignty and there's Walter Badgett's efficient secret. You know, the executive and legislative branch is the hyphen which joins the buckle which fastens. So, yeah, I'm going to use it both as an heuristic and as a, an, as, a, and as a normative, in a sense of what should be. Uh, and I'll also draw you know, another element of the standard account of Westminster, which is the two-party system. It's something we, we're all yeah. familiar with in our various jurisdictions, aren't we? Uh, Aaron Lippert identified that as one of the defining features of Westminster. 
Uh, and some would say the two-party duopoly is no more or it's coming under pressure. Certainly that's the case one senses in Australia. Certainly it's the case one senses in the United Kingdom, I think, Catherine. Um, and the move by New Zealand to a different electoral system, a mixed member proportional system, MMP, did, in the minds of some, foreshadow the end of the two-party duopoly. That's the poll of polls in New Zealand from 2014 to the present date. The two major parties are still the two major parties. The minor parties are there, but the major parties will essentially be the key players in forming uh, any government. Not for today, but New Zealand's constitution, as I say, is largely uncodified in statute, and the constitution therefore does allow for iterative change. It is porous, it is flexible. And there has been significant constitutional change in New Zealand by way of changes to the cabinet manual, which I think is one of the more significant elements of the New Zealand constitution. And one can look at that, go online, follow the link and see very significant changes over time in those provisions relating to collective cabinet responsibility, which have been attendant upon the realities of uh, multi-party government. Two more matters to be touched on. The concentration of political power in a collective and responsible cabinet. And so part of, I guess, the, the academic conversation discourse around this, and, and I note my colleague John Johansson will be talking to you later, is of the punitive move from cabinet to prime minister or even uh, quasi-presidential government. Increasingly, we, we hear about kitchen cabinets in Australia in particular. I think we hear about captain's calls. This wonderful new development, the captain's call. And in the UK, we have Chilcot, um, which repays a careful read. It's a lengthy document, but there's an interesting section there on decision-making within the cabinet process, or some might say perhaps the lack of any process of decision-making within the cabinet. One more from our standard definition. Parliamentary sovereignty with its unity of the executive and the legislature. On the first, and again, uh, particularly for Australia and New Zealand, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, the TPPA. ISDS provisions, and you know, because of what's been going on in your High Court, the issue of whether or not the Commonwealth Government enjoys the sovereignty, in fact, to legislate on plain paper packaging for tobacco products. So I think there is an issue there around sovereignty going forward. Anyway, back to this constitutional bureaucracy with a non-partisan and expert civil service and a compelling image. And it's one that resonates, I think, for us all, particularly for Australians and New Zealanders, uh, but equally, I think, for those uh, uh, from the United Kingdom. And some of you may recall seeing this last year. Uh, it was a piece published by John Nethico, one of the great contributors, I think, to uh, contemporary public administration in this, in this country. And published, I think, uh, in The Age? I'm not sure. I think it may have been. Yes, it was The Age. Gallipoli's other casualty, the suppression of frank and fearless advice. Too few military officers and public servants were allowed to speak freely before the disastrous Dardanelles campaign. The disastrous Dardanelles campaign. And in the aftermath of that campaign, there was a commission of inquiry. I won't go into the slide in any great detail. They'll be available for you afterwards. But the Commission's report documented the gross inadequacy of decision-making and failures to cope with the enormous and novel demands of the Great War. It was suitably severe about Asquith's failure to summons a meeting of the War Council. So again, we go back to issues of process. But it's this issue of free and frank advice that interests me the most. The report paid close attention to relations between ministers and their professional advisers, principally in the War Council, where they were largely silent. Their performance would, no doubt, says Nethercote, have earned the appropriation the approbation, sorry, of the Responsiveness School of Ministerial Official Relations. Possibly unkind to New Zealand. Don't mention free and frank. Um, plenty of interest in the subject. Uh, one model, Albert Hirschman, Exit Voice and Loyalty. What do you do as a public servant in the kind of situation where it comes to free and frank advice? How many exit, even sotto voce? How many just keep their heads down? You've probably seen this before, most of you. In fact, some of you may have seen it on numerous occasions. I still go back to it. Ken Henry, his advice to Treasury officials in 2007. 
the options they had as public servants, what the government needs to be told, what it doesn't need to be told, what it wants to hear, what it does not want to hear. And the virtuous quadrants being obviously these two here, the need to have responsive and responsible advice. So I think those of us have been close to government and the slide has sort of slightly squashed the term there, have probably seen a little bit of the obsequious behaviour from time to time. I'm going to do something that's annoying. I apologise, I'm flicking through two slides. I think it's fair to say in New Zealand that one element of the Westminster framework has caused more disquiet than others, and that's the diminution, or the perceived diminution, shall we say, as he looks across to a chief executive to his right in the constitutional status. And I use the word constitutional. It's interesting that Rhodes and Weller use the adjective constitutional in describing the role of the public service, particularly in serving the public through the provision of free and frank advice. Now, this is a recent Dominion Post uh, editorial from Wellington. And the Dominion Post is not a sort of tabloid uh, paper. It's not prone to sort of ranting and raving. Quote, the government and I accept that some would contest this, has shown a certain disdain for the civil service. Interesting they use the term civil service in a Wellington <laughs> editorial. This is not a government that encourages its advisers to proffer unwelcome advice, and that it is not alone, of course. So in that sense, it's going back in time. It's not saying it's a function of a government of a particular the, uh, philosophical or, or, or persuasion. Sometimes officials should be brave and tell the minister something that he or she doesn't want to hear. We have a new State Services Commissioner in New Zealand, Peter Hughes. Hughes's job as Commissioner, the editorial went on to say, is to show some spine and to back top officials who do likewise. And I should add there, although it's not coming through, that I'm not alone in wishing Peter well in his new role, particularly <laughs> given that challenge. Here's another way of looking at, at free and frank advice. Uh, it's a formula that I've used in the context of being a, uh, a ministerial advisor. And that's to see it as, uh, as, as, as a public service capability. So that involves capacity, it involves opportunity, and that leads to the capability of being able to tender free and frank and fearless advice. Capacity, knowledge, institutional memory. Something I think that Bill English mentioned institutional memory. Future thinking, again, consistent with Bill's view, not a presentist bias. A comparativist mindset. An openness for policy transfer. Not one size fits all. The world is required to act in a theoretical fashion. Or we don't take risks. Opportunity. Well, we can look at enablers. And I think in this sense, Bill English is the model of an excellent enabler as a minister. Ministers who want responsible and responsive advice. Ministers who know what stewardship really means. Ministers who encourage blue skies thinking. Chief executives or departmental secretaries who want to provide them with that advice, not, quote, our job, minister, is simply to make you look good. And then we have the disenablers. I'm not going to go to them at any great length. I appreciate time constraints, so I'm waiting for a nod from Dan to say we're... Um, You're okay. I'm okay. That's good to know. You're okay as well. <laughs> probably there's, we'll a see. there's a book. There's a book title on that, probably. Um, <laughs> ministers who want to be able to propose and have officials who simply dispose. Departments captured by path dependence or groupthink. Departments concerned about departments. Ministers who really do believe that there's only one way and there is no alternative. Ministers whose time frame extends only to the next election. Ministers who use bloggers and social media to undermine public servants or even to out them. And those who are from New Zealand will pick up the reference mm. there in very clear terms. It's fair to say I think that Crosby Texter uh, has implications for the way in which politics occurs. It also has implications for public administration. Ministers who shop around until they get the advice they want to hear. Ministers who create their own policy shops. Political staff, something that I've spent some time looking at, as has in, who funnel advice or in other ways politicise the process. A culture of fear and bullying. You're not going to get anything done in a culture of that kind. Whether it's the public service, whether it's the university, 
or whether it's any other organisation. I quoted a great Australasian public servant and academic from the ANU in a speech to the New Zealand Institute of Public Administration last week. Quote, the resuscitation of a democratic ethic of public service, I say resuscitation because there is a widespread view that our public services, especially at the middle and higher levels, has suffered losses in morale and ethical standards and their sense of public responsibility. Perhaps in comparison with the heady post-war days when political and administrative leaders looked to the building of a brave new world of peace, prosperity and social justice. Weakened morale is partly a function of emotional insecurity. Whether or not connected with morale, weakened ethical standards show not only an immeasurable rise in official corruption, but also in a widespread mixture of pragmatism, cynicism and evasion. I pose the question, but I won't seek an answer from you. Some of you may know. Who the, who's the author? The author's R.S. Parker. The article appeared in the 1989, in a 1989 issue of the Australian Journal of Public Administration. And I still continue to see it as one of the seminal works in the discipline and profession, as relevant today as it ever was. And it's entitled, and this picks up on something that Peter Shergold said last night, this notion of vocation, okay, the administrative vocation, just about to finish up now. I went on to say, and I suspect <laughs> to the annoyance of one or two people, that I do hope that kind of sentiment is a pebble in the shoe of the leaders of present day central agencies. Not only in terms of what needs to be done, but also in learning from the past. In my experience, the present leadership of our agencies central and otherwise, tends, let me temper it, at times to be somewhat Panglossian. In an administrative sense, we live now, they boldly assert, in the best of all possible worlds. That is what I hear them saying. There was no golden age, there are no lessons to be drawn. John Patterson, Nugget Coombs, Arthur Tang, Roland Wilson, Sir John Crawford, Peter Walensky, Ken Henry, and I'm sure many more before. In defence of Westminster, we know that there are pressures and threats, so let's be vigilant. We know that in many respects resuscitation is not required in much of what you do. The administrative vocation does live on, and in my assessment, the pulse is strong. Kia kaha, kia manawanui. Thank you.